Teachings of an Initiate Chapter 12 The Scientific Method of Spiritual Unfoldment Part 1 Material Analogies While we were coming down by involution into concrete existence, our line of progress may lay entirely in material development. But since we have rounded the nadder of materiality and are beginning to rise above the concrete, spiritual unfoldment is becoming increasingly important as a necessary factor in our development, although we still have many great and important lessons to learn from the material phase of our existence. This applies to humanity in general, but particularly, of course, to those who are already consciously beginning to aspire to live the higher life. It may therefore be expedient I'll say that again. It may therefore be expedient to review, review from another angle the Rosicrucian teachings as to the scientific method of acquiring the spiritual unfoldment. People of the older generation, particularly in Europe and the eastern states of America, will undoubtedly remember pleasure their travels along quite country lines, and how time and again they have passed by a rippling stream with an old rustic mill its creaking water wheel laboriously turning the crude machinery within, using but a small fraction of the power stored in the running water, which was going uselessly to waste, save for such partial use. But later on, a new generation came and perceived the possibilities to be realized by a scientific use of this enormous energy. Engineers began to construct dams to keep the water from flowing in the former wasteful manner, they diverted the water from the storage reservoirs through pipes or flumes to the water wheels constructed upon scientific principles, and they husbanded the great energy w which they had stored by letting in only water to turn the water wheels at a given speed and with a given load. But while the scientifically constructed water wheel was a giant compared with its crude predecessor, it was subject to some of the same limitations. Its enormous energy could only be used at the place where the power was located, and such places are usually many miles from the centers of civilization where power is most needed. By working with the laws of nature, man had secured a servant, on, a servant of inexhaustible energy, but how to make it available where most needed, that was the question. To solve that problem, again the laws of nature were invoked, electric generators were coupled to the water wheels. The water power was transformed into electrical energy and an endeavor made to send it from the sources of its development to the cities where it might be used. But this again required scientific methods of working with the laws of nature, for it was found that different, materi different metals transmit electricity with varying facility, the best of them being copper and silver. Copper was therefore chosen as the less expensive of the two. Let the student observe that we cannot compel these forces to do anything. Whenever we use them, it is by working with the laws that govern their manifestation. In capitals. By choosing the line of least resistance to obtain the maximum of energy. If wires of iron or German silver, which have a comparatively high resistance, had been chosen as transmitters, a great deal of energy would have been thus lost. Besides, other complications would have resulted which we need not enter into for our purpose. But by working with the laws of nature and choosing the line of least resistance, we obtain the best result in the easiest manner. There were other problems which confronted these experiments, experimenters in their transformation of the water power used in the old water wheels to electricity usable many miles from the source of power. It was found that an electric current would always seek the ground by the nearest path if there were any possibility of doing so. Hence it became necessary that the wire carrying the electric current be separated from the earth by some material that would prevent it from thus escaping, exactly as a high wall keeps a prisoner behind it. Something had to be found for which electricity had a natural aversion, and hit and his was discovered in glass, porcelain, and certain fibrous substances, thus solving by scientific means and ingenuity, working always with the laws of nature, the problem of how to use the best advantage in distant places, the great energy where the old crude mill wheel had wasted as its source. The same application of scientific methods to other problems of life, such as gardening, has also secured wonderful results for the benefit and comfort of humanity, making 200 blades of grass grow where formerly by the crude oil methods, the crude old methods, sorry, not one even could find substance. 
Wizards like Luther Burbank have improved upon the wild varieties of fruit and vegetables, making them larger, more luscious and palatable, as well as more prolific. And wherever haphazard practices are former days, the same benefit results, results have been achieved. But as said before, and this is very important for our consideration, everything that has been done has been accomplished by working with the laws of nature, in capitals. The hermetic axiom, as, a, as above so below, enunciates the law of analogy, the master key to all mysteries, spiritual or material, and we may safely infer that what holds good in the application of scientific methods to material problems will have equal force when applied to the solution of spiritual mysteries. The most cursory review of religious development in the past will be sufficient to show that it has been anything but scientific and systematic, and that the most haphazard methods have prevailed. On account of their capacity for devotion, a few have risen to sublime heights of spirituality unknown and are known through the ages as saints, shining lights upon the pathway, showing what may be done. But how to achieve that sublime spirituality has been and is a mystery to all, even to those who most ardently desire such development, and these are, alas, comparatively few at the present time. The elder brothers of the Rosicrucians have, however, originated a scientific method which, if persistently and consistently followed, will develop the sleeping soul powers in any individual just as surely as constant practice will make a person proficient in any material line of endeavor. To understand this matter, it is necessary to realize that facts in the case, it was the old crude mill wheel that gave water power in an efficient manner and to much greater advantage. If we first study the natural development of soul power by evolution, we shall then be in a position to understand the great and beneficial results to be derived from an application of scientific methods to this important matter. Students of the Rosicrucian teachings are of course familiar with the main points in this process of humanity's development by evolution, but there may be a number who are not so informed. And so for their sake we will give a little further outline than might otherwise be necessary. Science says, and correctly so, that an invisible, intangible substant, substance called ether permeates everything from the densest solids to the air which we breathe. This ether has never been seen, measured, or analyzed by science, but it is necessary to postulate its existence in order to account for various phenomena, such as, for instance, the transmission of light through a vacuum. There, science says, ether is the medium of transmission of the light ray. Thus the ether carries to us a picture of our vision and impresses it upon the retina of our eyes. Similarly, when a motion picture operator photographs a number of scenes in a play, the ether carries pictures of all objects. The motions they make, et cetera, excuse me, it said et cetera, etc. Cetera, to the minute details through the lens of his camera to the sensitized plate leaving a complete record of all the scenery and every act of the actors in that play. And if there were in our eyes a similar sensitized film of sufficient length to hold the pictures, we should at the end of our life have a complete record of every event that had taken place in it, that is, provided we could see. But there are a number of people who are deficient in various senses. One thing, however, they must all do to live, they must breathe, in capitals. And nature, which is only another name for God, has thus rightly decreed that the record be kept by this universally used means. Every moment of our action in the drama of life from the first breath to the last dying gasp, the ether which is drawn into our lungs carries with it a complete picture of our outside environment, of our actions and the actions of other people who are with us, the record being impressed upon one single little atom placed in the left ventricle at the apex of the heart where the newly oxygenated blood thus carrying with it a different picture for every moment of our life, passes by in a continual stream. Therefore, all that we say or do from the least to the greatest, from the best to the worst, is written in our heart in indialable characters. This record is the basis of the natural slowed method of soul growth by evolution, corresponding to the crude and ancient water wheel. In the next chapter we shall see how it is thus used and how, by scientific means, soul growth may be accomplished and soul power unfolded by an improvement on this process.